objection. Madam President, international trade has always been controversial. That has been true since the days of the Smoot-Hawley uh, effort. Hawley, by the way, was an Oregon congressman. And it continues to be true today. But it is so important to our country and so important to my home state that I made a special priority when I was given the honor of serving on the Senate Finance Committee to queue up to be able to chair the Subcommittee on International Trade and Global Competitiveness. Because I think it is so important that we continue here in the United States Senate to keep pushing. And there's going to be a lot of work to do after these agreements have been voted on to get this right. But I want to describe today three aspects of this debate that are indisputable. In other words, we have lots of differences of opinion with respect to past agreements. Did they create jobs? They didn't create jobs. How did it affect various parts of the country? And suffice it to say, reasonable people can differ with respect to these analyses. But I've been able as the chair of this uh, subcommittee, the Senate Finance Subcommittee on Trade and Competitiveness, to dig deeply into this issue. And I believe there are three indisputable positions with respect to the agreements we'll be voting on tonight that the Senate ought to take into consideration and are at the core of why I will be voting later this evening in favor of the agreements. The first position, Madam President, is there is a huge appetite all around the world for American goods and services. We are the gold standard. People around the world want to buy brand USA. They want to display it. They want to feature it. There's no question that we have an opportunity to feed this huge demand for American goods and services. I think we ought to go forward and tap this opportunity. And Madam President, the bottom line is if we don't take this opportunity to burnish this brand America and get our goods and services around the world, we can be very sure that somebody else will be right there, and it is most likely to be China. That's point number one, Madam President. I think it's indisputable. Point number two is the challenge today in global markets is to capture the entire supply chain, Madam President. That means everything from raw materials to component parts to the finished goods. And when I talk about this opportunity to capture the global supply chain, Madam President, what it means to me in Oregon, and I think it means the same thing in North Carolina or South Dakota, I see my friend and colleague, he is the ranking uh, member on the Trade Subcommittee, been a pleasure for me to work with. I think all over the United States, Capturing this supply chain in the global economy means the same thing. And that is what we ought to do. What I say at home in Oregon, and I'm sure my friend in South Dakota says exactly the same thing, let us grow it in Oregon, let us make it in Oregon, let us add value to it in Oregon, and then let us ship it somewhere. It is a huge, huge opportunity we have in front of us Madam President, to tap this global supply chain where once again, if we walk away from this kind of opportunity, we can be very certain that China will be right there to fill that void. The third issue involves the question of tariffs. And Madam President, I've heard people say, well, you know, these agreements have lots of other things in them, lots of other provisions that are unrelated to tariffs. There's no question that that's accurate. But at the end of the day, Madam President, 
If our tariffs are in effect high, when we want to ship our products around the world, when we get faced with very high tariffs from those, we, those markets that we want to get into, and when countries ship to us, they have low tariffs, that is a very substantial advantage for our trading partners. As I highlighted yesterday in the Senate Finance uh, Committee, when we want to send our beef, Oregon beef, to Korea, we face a 40% tariff when we send it to Korea. When they send their beef to us here in the United States, it's 4%. It's a tenfold tariff. Madam President, I can go through a whole host of other products where wine from my state goes into Korea. It is a 15-fold uh, difference. Value-added wood products. I know the senator from North Carolina cares an awful lot about wood products. Well, the fact of the matter is, if we want to send finished wood into Korea, not the raw materials, we all know that what we want to do, again, is add value to wood products, a key component of the Pacific Northwest economy, of the southern you know, economy. We want to add value to it. Well, the fact is that the tariffs are four times as high for finished wood products in Korea as they are here in the United States. Now, these are indisputable facts, Madam President, the question of the tariffs, the question of the global supply chain, and the brand USA opportunity that I've described as this huge appetite for American goods and services that exist around the world, that I think we'd be making a grave mistake uh, to pass up. Now, there are a lot of other issues associated with the votes that we're going to have uh, to cast. I feel very strongly about the Trade Adjustment Assistance uh, Program, Madam President, because I want to make sure that in an economy that is constantly changing, our workers have a trampoline, in effect, to get the training and the skills to get in to other areas. And people think that the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program is just about workers. Madam President, this is a crucial program for employers, and that's why it has so much support among employers. Employers need those talented workers in order to meet uh, the demands that they have to produce those quality goods and services. And by the way, Madam President, one of the concerns business uh, is continually citing, and increasingly so, is the mismatch that they often face where they need workers who have one uh, sort of skills, and people have been trained for something else. So with the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program, we can close that problem. We can do more to ensure that we get to our businesses, workers with the kinds of skills that they need most, and do something about this mismatch. So the idea that Trade Adjustment Assistance is just for workers is really uh, a mistake of fundamental, fundamental understanding about what the program's about because it is a major uh, plus to, uh, to our uh, employers. So we're going to be zeroing in on these kinds uh, of issues, worker issues, uh, another one that we'll be looking at uh, on the subcommittee involves uh, issues relating to workers' rights under the us Columbia Free Trade uh, Agreement. There, our concern is violence, demonstrable, serious violence, against Colombian union members and the impunity that the perpetrators of such violence have enjoyed. Now, this situation does seem to be getting uh, a bit better. The Santos administration understands uh, the concern. There is an agreement with Colombia on an action plan on labor that sets in motion a series of steps that the Colombian government is taking to provide workers with more adequate labor rights and protection uh, from violence. But there is a lot more to do, Madam President, and I intend to conduct meaningful oversight over the labor situation in Colombia and Colombia's adherence 
to its commitments to the Obama administration. As far as I'm concerned, that's going to start, Madam President, just as soon as these agreements have been voted on, and Senator Stabenow and Senator Car Cardin and Senator Menendez will be joining me, and we're all going to be doing a more to make sure that the Obama administration provides the Congress with annual reports on the labor situation in Colombia and the impact of the labor action plan that was reached by the Obama administration and the Santos administration. So, I've mentioned trade adjustment assistance. I've mentioned uh, labor uh, rights. And I want to really close in terms of future work that's related uh, to this uh, topic, uh, Madam President, by talking about China. Because certainly these trade agreements and to tap the opportunity, particularly in our country, for family wage employment through more exports is going to require tougher enforcement of our trade laws and particularly the Obama administration getting serious about enforcing the laws on the books. We have had a series of investigations looking at cheating. Cheating, Madam President, I use that word specifically, I guess you could call it merchandise uh, laundering, because some of our trading you know, partners, when they're found to violate the countervailing duty laws, in effect, instead of doing the right thing and coming into compliance, they just ship it through another country. And this is going to be an even more important uh, challenge. And we've got bipartisan legislation in order to stop the cheating, to strengthen uh, the enforcement. It's going to be even more important to pass that effort to uh, eliminate this kind of cheating because with respect to the agreement and Korea, Chinese suppliers have a long history of laundering their goods through Korea in order to avoid U.S. trade laws. So the question of cheating, which we have documented in our uh, hearings of the Finance Subcommittee on International Trade, bipartisan bill, I believe three Democratic senators, three Republican senators were ready to go. I was very pleased in the discussion uh, in the Finance uh, Committee, Chairman Baucus and Senator Hatch, the ranking minority member, said that this effort to fight these practices, the, this kind of cheating, which potentially could get worse unless you strengthen uh, enforcement, Chairman Baucus and Senator Hatch said it was going to be a priority for them, and they wanted to make our anti-cheating uh, legislation uh, a must-pass effort before the end of this year, that they would attach it to uh, a must-pass piece of legislation. I could go on, Madam President. Even today, uh, the administration is going forward with the anti-counterfeiting uh, you know, agreement without doing it with the approval of the United States Congress. I think that's a mistake. I think that's a misreading of the law, that the executive branch can just do it of its own accord. We're going to tackle that in the days ahead because those issues are important now. They will be even more important given the expansions of trade and commerce uh, when these agreements uh, are approved. So there is a lot to do. But at the end of the day, Madam President, if we miss one opportunity to do more in this country to market our brand around the world and to make things here and grow things here and continually add value to them, dominate that supply chain, which I think is going to be the overriding issue for global competitiveness in the days ahead. If we walk away from those issues, Madam President, we're walking away from the opportunity for our people to get good paying jobs in the private sector. In my home state, international trade is a very significant barometer of our economy, with estimates even being one out of seven jobs in Oregon depends on international trade, and the trade jobs pay better than do the non-trade jobs. I don't want other countries to get those 
opportunities to get their goods and services, high value goods and services that I'd like to see Oregon workers and American workers have a chance to make here. Madam President, I call them red, white, and blue jobs. That's the kind of jobs I want for this country that I know the President and the Senate wants, where we do allow American productivity and American in ingenuity to continually innovate. There are other issues. I know the President and the Senate cares a great deal about tax policy, global tax policy. Senator Coates and I have a bipartisan tax reform proposal, so we look forward to working with you on, on that issue. But today is a chance to expand our opportunity to get the American brand, the USA brand for goods and services in markets that are growing, in markets that you can bet China uh, wants. And Madam President, I know this is controversial, has been, as I said, since the days of Smoot Hawley, and we Oregonians sure know a little bit about that because of Congressman Hawley. But I think for our workers and the chance to get our goods and services into growing markets, growing markets that China wants, I hope uh, my colleagues will, uh, will support uh, this effort and support the agreements. And with that, Madam President, I yield the floor. And, uh, I would note, uh, Madam President, the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Madam President, I uh, too rise in strong support of the pending trade agreements with America's allies, Colombia, South Korea, and Panama. These agreements hold great promise for American farmers, manufacturers, service providers, and American consumers. And I would echo what my uh, colleague from Oregon, who does chair the Subcommittee on Trade on the Finance Committee, has already said, and that is that these trade agreements position American businesses to capture more of that supply chain, to enable us to create jobs here at home, and to, to grow the economy, to generate economic activity out there that otherwise we wouldn't see happening. And so at a time when we need to focus our efforts on measures that will promote economic growth and job creation, these agreements are exactly the type of legislation that we ought to be considering. There's broad consensus that these agreements are going to benefit our economy. The Obama White House estimates, estimates that enactment of these three trade agreements will boost exports by at least $12 billion, supporting over 70,000 American jobs. The Business Roundtable estimates that passage of these trade agreements will support as many as 250,000 American jobs. And these are not the only jobs that large businesses, but increasingly at smaller companies that are accessing international markets. And just as an example of that, more than 35,000 small business, small I should say, and mid-sized American businesses export to Colombia, Panama, and South Korea. And these firms now account for more than one-third of U.S. exports to these countries. Passing these three trade agreements will provide export opportunities to American businesses of all sizes, creating good-paying jobs here at home. The benefits to U.S. agriculture of passing these agreements are especially compelling. These three agreements are estimated to represent $3 billion in new agricultural exports that will support 22,500 U.S. agricultural-related jobs. My state of South Dakota is a good example. If you look at the export potential for U.S. agriculture that are represented by these agreements, according to the American Farm Bureau Federation, these agreements will add $52 million each year to South Dakota's farm economy. South Dakota is projected to gain $22 million from increased 
beef exports, $25 million from increased exports of wheat, soybeans, and corn, and $5 million from increased uh, pork shipments each year. America's market is already largely open to imports from many of our trading partners. In fact, almost 99% of agricultural products from Colombia and Panama, for example, enter the United States duty-free. Without trade agreements to ensure similar treatment for our exporters, American businesses will continue to face high tariff and non-tariff barriers abroad. Consider just one example, and that's the market for agricultural products in Korea, which is the world's 13th largest economy. Korea's tariffs on imported agricultural goods average 54% compared to an average of 9% tariff on, these, on their imports into the United States. So passage of the Korea Free Trade Agreement will level this playing field. Think about that, Madam President. 54% for our exporters to get into the Korean market, 9% tariff for their exports coming here. That is a huge discrepancy that will be rectified by passage of this agreement. Korea's market for pork products in particular underscores how removing barriers to trade can benefit U.S. farmers and ranchers. U.S. pork exports to Korea, South Korea, have increased 130 percent from January to July of this year because Korea temporarily lifted its 25 percent duty on pork imports due to, an out, due to an outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Korea. During this period, the Korean market surpassed Canada to become the third largest export destination for U.S. pork producers after Japan and Mexico. Korea's tariff on pork imports is expected to return, but would be permanently eliminated by 2016 under the terms of the U.S. and South Korea Free Trade Agreement. So that we know that when we eliminate barriers to U.S. exports, American producers will compete and win in the global marketplace. However, if we fail to act and continue to delay implementation of these agreements, the cost to our economy will also be substantial. The United States Chamber of Commerce study warns that failure to enact the three pending trade agreements could threaten as many as 380,000 American jobs and the loss of $40 billion in sales. The cost of inaction on trade is high because today we live in a global economy where American producers rely on access to foreign markets. Consider that in 1960 exports accounted for only 3.6 percent of our entire GDP. Today, Exports account for 12.5 percent of our entire GDP. Exports of U.S. goods and services support over 10 million American jobs. When America stands still on trade, the rest of the world does not. Madam President, today there are more than 100 new free trade agreements that are currently under negotiation around the world. Yet in the United States, we're only party to one of those negotiations, and that's the Trans-Pacific Partnership. If we do not aggressively pursue new market opening agreements on behalf of American workers, we will see new export opportunities go to foreign businesses and foreign workers. Unfortunately, that is exactly what we have experienced under the current administration. The three trade agreements that we're considering today were signed over four years ago, and this administration had more than two and a half years to submit them to Congress for consideration, but failed to do so. Instead, the President chose to sit on these agreements and not send them to Congress for nearly now 1,000 days. Now, we cannot quantify precisely the cost of this unfortunate delay, but we know that it's put American exporters at a competitive disadvantage in the Colombian, Korean, and Panamanian markets. For example, on July 1st, the Euro European Union-Korea trade agreement went into effect. In just the first months after this agreement took effect, EU exports to Korea jumped nearly 37 percent, while U.S. exports to Korea rose by only 3 percent. Now, let's be clear about what this means, Madam President. Korean consumers are choosing to buy German, French, and British cars, electronics, and agricultural products rather than American-made products because those European products now have a price advantage. This was entirely preventable if we'd acted on the U.S.-Korea trade agreement sooner. Likewise, the Canada-Columbia agreement went into effect on August 15th of this year. This is resulting in an advantage for Canadian goods, such as construction equipment, aircraft, and a range of other industrial and agricultural products. Colombia is now reporting that since the Canada-Columbia trade agreement took effect, there's been an 18.3% increase in Colombian imports of Canadian wheat. 
Much as with Korea, U.S. businesses are finding themselves disadvantaged because the President waited so long before sending these agreements to Congress. Unfortunately, the negative impact of the Canada-Columbia agreement on U.S. exporters is just a continuation of the lost export opportunities we've seen over the past few years as these trade agreements have lingered. Just a few years ago, American wheat producers dominated the market in Colombia with a 73% market share as of 2008. Today, we are facing a situation where U.S. wheat producers are likely to be completely shut out of the Colombian market if we don't act. Hopefully, by passing these agreements today and by swiftly implementing the U.S.-Columbia Trade Promotion Agreement, our wheat producers will be able to recover much of their lost market share. But they should never have been placed in this position to begin with. In 2010, for the first time in the history of U.S.-Columbia trade, the U.S. lost to Argentina its position as Colombia's number one agricultural supplier. Now, let's consider the story of three of the major crops that we grow in South Dakota, soybean, corn, and wheat. The combined market share in Colombia for these three U.S. agricultural exports has decreased from 78% in 2008 to 28% as of 2010, a staggering decline of 50 percentage points in our market share. U.S. corn sales to Colombia fell from 3 million metric tons in 2007 to 700,000 metric tons in 2010. This is the high cost, Madam President, of delay while our trading partners pursue new regional and bilateral trade agreements. There's also been the cost of duties that have been paid on U.S. exports while these agreements waited. There's a, U.S. companies have paid more than $5 billion in tariffs to Colombia and Panama since the trade agreements with these nations were signed more than four years ago. Now let's consider the cost of delay to just one of U.S. One, one American company, and that's Caterpillar. We all know Caterpillar is a leading producer of large construction and mining equipment and a major U.S. exporter. Caterpillar exports 92 percent of its American-made large mining trucks. Caterpillar's large trucks export, char, large truck exports, I should say, to Colombia face a 15 percent duty, which adds about $300,000 to the cost of each of these trucks exported to Colombia. I mean, how does that work, Madam President? Think about that. Every truck that Caterpillar sends into the, the, the Colombian market, it's an additional $300,000 on top of the, the cost of that piece of equipment for the tariff uh, that has to be paid. Just imagine the advantage that Caterpillar could have had for the last several years over its Japanese and Chinese competitors if the House of Representatives, that at the time was controlled by the Democrats back in 2008, had not refused to consider the Columbia Agreement when President Bush submitted it, or if the current administration had acted sooner. And that is just one example of countless others out there with American businesses. And so I'm glad that we're here today, and I expect all three trade agreements to pass with what I hope is broad bipartisan support. I hope we also have learned an important lesson. We cannot afford to delay when it comes to international competition and trade. I hope the White House has learned an important lesson as well. Rather than submitting to Congress divisive measures where there are fundamental disagreements, such as new tax increases, this administration should identify measures, such as these trade bills, that will spur our economy and where there is broad bipartisan agreement. The President sent his American Jobs Act to Congress exactly a month ago today, yet we only just last night voted on whether we should consider this bill, a vote that did not get a single Republican, and it didn't get every Democrat vote either. Now contrast that approach with these free trade agreements which were submitted to Congress by the President on October 3rd, just nine days ago. Within about a week and a half, these trade agreements will have passed the relevant committees and the House and the Senate with large bipartisan votes and will be on the President's desk awaiting his signature. Clearly, reaching across the aisle on measures where both parties can find agreement is a much more effective approach. And so I would urge my colleagues to support these job-creating trade bills based upon their merits. I would also urge my colleagues to support these bills to send a message that when this administration is willing to send us common sense, pro-growth legislation, we are ready and willing to pass it. We can only hope that our votes today on these trade agreements will set that precedent. So, Madam President, I look forward to voting for these long overdue agreements on behalf of American businesses and consumers, and I look forward, hopefully, to being, able to being able to act on what are truly pro-growth job measures in the coming weeks and months. 
We have an economy that continues to struggle with over 9 percent unemployment. We continue to see month after month a lot of Americans who are without jobs and this is one example of something that we can do to address that concern but there are lots of other things out there that we could be doing as well madam president if we're willing to identify those things on which there is agreement and those types of policies that actually do create jobs that are about getting americans back to work not by not about making some some sort of a political statement i hope that will be this will set a pattern and a trend uh, that will be replicated in the future and that we can do some things that are really good for American economy and for American jobs. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Missouri. I thank, the, thank you for the recognition and uh, want to join with my good friend from South Dakota and the comments he made about the disadvantage we've created for ourselves in the last three years by not moving forward with these trade agreements uh, long ago, but we are going to move forward today. You know, jump-starting America's economy is going to require bipartisanship. Uh, and if we're going to compete in a global economy, it means we're all going to have to work together to help create economic opportunities for Americans who are looking for work to create those private sector jobs that are the difference in a prosperous economy and an economy that's struggling. Uh, last night, the motion to open debate on the president's uh, so-called jobs bill was, was amended by his own party and was defeated then by a bipartisan vote here in the Senate. That's not the kind of bipartisanship we need. We need bipartisanship moving forward, not bipartisanship walking away. The bill was defeated because it doesn't make economic sense, as the president said in August of 2009, to raise taxes on job creators. And in fact, the administration, by its own accounting, says that roughly 80% of the people who'd be impacted by the surtax imposed by the bill that uh, was set aside last night uh, would, be would be defined as businesses, the very businesses that need to create jobs in an economy where that should be uh, the number one priority. The President's first $800 billion stimulus plan uh, failed to stimulate. Uh, it didn't really create the private sector jobs we need and simply my view of of the $450 billion we were talking about yesterday was that it was more of the same. Uh, but today isn't more of the same. Today is a bipartisan opportunity to move forward with a bipartisan bill and to help jumpstart our economy. If there's low-hanging fruit in job creation, it's exporting products to markets that want to buy our products. And this is not about labor conditions in Colombia or whatever might happen uh, in, in uh, Korea or Panama, uh, this is about products that American workers make and whether they can get into those markets or not. Madam President, I'd say one other time that for, for over a de well over a decade now, Colombian products all come into our country without a tariff under something called the Andean uh, Free Trade Agreement. Well, so this can't be about Colombian labor must be about American labor and what can we do for American workers we can open up markets for American products and that's what we're going to do today for as I hope we move to uh, to agree to these trade bills these trade agreements would mean an additional two and a half billion dollars per year in agricultural exports uh, every billion dollars worth of ag exports means an estimated eight eight thousand uh, new jobs in Missouri, the trade-related jobs grew by more than three times faster uh, than other employment from 2004 to 2008. I recently asked Missourians on Facebook and Twitter to share some of their personal stories about how they thought these trade agreements uh, would impact their lives. Glenn Cope, a young full-time farmer from Aurora, Missouri, noted, he said, quote, agriculture is not drawing young people to stay on the farm because it's difficult to make land payments based on what little we get for the products we produce versus the inputs, and this has been the case now for generations. Glenn called on Congress to help farmers by creating more demand for our products if we're going to get young people to stay and take over the farm. You know, Madam President, their parents and grandparents have produced food for our country and for much of the world for a long time now. Glenn Cope's generation can continue to do the same. Chris Chen, who runs a family farm in Clarence, Missouri, in northeast Missouri, told me that if these trade deals pass, 
her family could receive almost $11 more for every hog they sell. Now, she noted that while $11 may not sound like a lot, it sure seemed like a lot when they were losing $20 for every hog they sold from 2007 uh, through 2010. Uh, that difference makes the difference in whether that family stays on the farm or not. Chris urged Congress to pass these agreements because this, quote, increase the revenue uh, that will help us meet increased expenses and help us ensure our family farm will be there to pass on to my kids, according to her, who she said would be the sixth generation of farmers in her family. Barbara Wilson noted that agriculture fuels the economy in our small town of Mexico, Missouri. She told me that the passage of these free trade agreements would lead to an increased demand for our corn and our soybeans and stressed that when the agricultural economy is good, the economy in our small town benefits. And that means increased jobs in all sectors of that small town economy. Brian Hammonds, the president of Hammonds Products Company in Stockton, Missouri, told me that significant government mandated trade barriers are hurting his attempts to compete and develop markets for American black walnuts, which are harvested by hand in Missouri and other Midwest western states. Brian noted that if these trade deals pass, our company could buy more black walnuts from thousands of people in Missouri and 11 other states providing cash uh, to those rural areas. And even more importantly, the increased product, production activity from processing these walnuts would allow us to provide more employment for people in our rural Missouri community. These are just a few of the farmers and job creators in Missouri who've been calling on Congress to pass these trade agreements. Uh, I look forward to voting for these agreements tonight. Uh, I hope uh, a, a huge majority of uh, my colleagues join me in voting for the South Korean agreement, the Panama agreement, the Colombian agreement, uh, and we send a message to the world that we intend to compete in a world economy, and if we're given the chance to compete, American workers can compete with anybody, and these trade agreements provide an opportunity to do that, and uh, I uh, yield back uh, the floor. Madam President, I enjoyed the remarks from my... The Senator from Vermont. I enjoyed the remarks from my friend from Missouri. Unfortunately, I, I can't quite agree with the thrust of, of his statement. Uh, in my view, uh, the current trade policies in this country uh, are a disaster. The evidence is very clear that they have cost us many millions of jobs. And to continue that same unfettered free trade philosophy in terms of trade agreements with Korea, Panama, and Colombia makes absolutely no sense at all. When you have a policy that is failing, you change it, you don't continue it. Uh, Madam President, uh, let us be very clear, as I think most Americans understand. Uh, our economy today is in a disastrous shape. Uh, our middle class is disappearing. Recent statistics told us that poverty levels are at an all-time high. Uh, and the gap between the very, very rich and everybody else is growing wider. And in my view, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons for the collapse of the middle class has to do with the loss of millions of good manufacturing jobs attributable to these disastrous trade policies. And if we are serious as a nation in wanting to rebuild the middle class, lower our poverty rates, what we have got to do is move forward in a new direction in trade based on fair trade principles and end this unfettered free trade which has been such a disaster for American workers. Uh, Madam President, over the last decade, uh, we as a nation have lost 50,000 manufacturing plants in our country. I want to repeat that because that is such a staggering number. Uh, that it needs to be said over and over again. 50,000 manufacturing plants in this country have shut down over the last 10 years alone. Uh, we have lost during that same period five and a half million factory jobs. And many of those jobs 
are good paying jobs. They are jobs that provided people with good wages uh, and good benefits. Those jobs are gone and in many cases have been replaced by Walmart, McDonald type jobs, low wages, minimal benefits. Uh, Madam President, to give you an extent about how significant uh, the decline in manufacturing in this country is, uh, the reality is that in 1970, 1970, 25 percent of all jobs in the United States were manufacturing jobs, and today that number is just 9 percent, 9 percent. In July of 2000, there were 17.3 million manufacturing workers in this country. Today there are only 11 million manufacturing workers. In my small state of Vermont, you know, Vermont is not Ohio, it's not Michigan, it has never been one of the great manufacturing centers in the country. But even in a small state like Vermont, what we have seen is a huge decline in good paying manufacturing jobs which has certainly impacted our middle class. Ten years ago, we had approximately 45,000 manufacturing jobs in Vermont. Last year, we had 31,000 manufacturing jobs. We've lost about a third of our manufacturing jobs. And I should tell you, uh, Mr. President, that 7,800 of those jobs were lost as a result of the trade agreement with China, and another 1,300 were lost as a result of NAFTA. The key issue here today, Mr. President, is whether we continue our disastrous trade policy, uh, which includes NAFTA, permanent normal trade relations with China and CAFTA. Do we add on to trade policies which have failed? And for the love of me, I cannot understand why anybody would want to do that. And the facts are very clear. Our current trade policies have failed, have been a disaster for working families. Mr. President, according to a recent study conducted by the well-respected economist at the Economic Policy Institute, the PNTR, Permanent Normal Trade Relations with China, has led to the loss of 2.8 million American jobs. 2.8 million American jobs. And I remember because I was in the House when that debate took place. And I heard the same thing then as I hear now. Members of Congress getting up and talking about all of the new jobs that were going to be created. Well, it wasn't true then. It is not true now. How can you defend a trade policy based on the same principles as PNTR with China when that policy has cost us 2.8 million jobs in the last year alone? And then we got NAFTA. Many of us remember all the rhetoric around NAFTA. My goodness, we're going to open up the entire Mexican economy for products made in the United States of America. We're going to be selling it in Mexico. Does anybody in America believe that that policy has worked, that NAFTA has worked? The facts are very clear. Again, according to the EPI, they found that NAFTA has led to the loss of 680,000 jobs. So the simple reality is, and you don't have to be a PhD in economics to figure out, that if a company has the option of hiring somebody in a low-wage country at 50 cents an hour, 70 cents an hour, don't have to deal with unions, don't have to deal with environmental standards, why would you not go to those countries? Well, the answer is you would go. The answer is they have gone. And that's what these trade policies are about. Not selling American produced products abroad, but creating a situation where companies can shut down in America, move factories abroad, and bring those products back into this country tariff free. Now, Mr. President, uh, we have quote after quote after quote from members of Congress who got up on the floor during the NAFTA debate during the China debate, and they told us about all the jobs that were going to be created. And it is astounding to me that I keep hearing that rhetoric when, in fact, nothing said in the past has proven to be true. Let me just quote uh, my good friends 
that's in quotes, that are really good friends, from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And uh, they tell us, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce tells us, and I quote, this is the, the, the discussion about uh, Korea, uh, Panama, and Colombia. This is foremost the debate about jobs. At a time when millions of Americans are out of work, these agreements will create real business opportunities that could generate hundreds of thousands of new jobs, end of quote. That's the Chamber of Commerce. But wait a second. Is this the same Chamber of Commerce that on July 1st, 2004, according to the Associated Press, said, and here's the headline on that article, Chamber of Commerce leader advocates offshoring of jobs, end of quote. And here's what the article stated about the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, who is such a strong advocate for these trade policies. Quote, U.S. Chamber of Commerce President and CEO Thomas Donahue urged American companies to send jobs overseas as a way to boost American competitiveness. Donahue said that exporting high-paid tech jobs to low-cost countries such as India, China, and Russia saves company, companies money, etc., etc., etc. So let's see. Chamber of Commerce is leading the effort for these trade agreements, but their leadership tells us that outsourcing of jobs is a good thing. Maybe, maybe you might want to think twice before you accepted the advice of the Chamber of Commerce. Mr. President, uh, the United States Department of Commerce has reported, and this is really very interesting, not only as information unto itself, but about the politics of this whole trade agreement. You got the Chamber of Commerce, you got every major multinational corporation in the country telling us how good this unfettered free trade policy is. But now we have the U.S. Department of Commerce has reported that over the last decade, U.S. multinational corporations slashed 2.9 million American jobs. All right, let's digest that. Large corporations, the multinationals come in here, and they tell us, oh, these trade agreements are great, they're going to create American jobs, but at the same time, over the last decade, they have slashed 2.9 million American jobs. But here is the other side of the story. The truth is that these same multinational corporations who are telling members of Congress to vote for these trade agreements, the truth is they are creating jobs. The only problem is the jobs they are creating are not in the United States of America. They are in China and other low-wage countries. Over this last same period, over this last decade, while they laid off 2.9 million American workers, these same multinational corporations created 2.4 million new jobs abroad. Lay off 2.9 million American workers, create 2.4 million jobs in China and other low-wage countries. And that, in a nutshell, is what these trade agreements are about. Enabling corporations to shut down in America, move to low-wage countries, and bring their products back into our country. And the results are very clear. The results are very clear. You don't need a great study done by the Department of Commerce or the Economic Policy Institute. All you have to do today is walk into any department store in America, and when you buy a product, you know where that product is manufactured. It's not manufactured in Vermont. It's not manufactured in California. It is, as often as not, manufactured in China, Mexico, or other developing countries. That has been the whole goal of these trade agreements. Shut down plants in America, move them abroad, hire low-wage workers there, bring the products into this country. And the idea that we would be extending this concept to Korea, uh, Panama, and Colombia makes no sense to me uh, at all. Mr. President, since the year 2000, 
2.8 million American jobs have been eliminated or displaced as a result of the increased trade deficit with China. And after all of the talk on the floor of the Senate and on the floor of the House and the editorial boards of major newspapers and by leading politicians about how the China trade agreement would create jobs in America, it is very interesting to hear what these corporations had to say a few years after the trade agreement was passed. In other words, before it is passed, they will tell you about how we're going to create all these jobs in America. The day after it's passed, their line changes. China Free Trade Agreement was passed uh, in around the year 2000. A couple of years later, Jeffrey Inmelt, the CEO of General Electric, was quoted on this subject at an investor meeting just one year after China was admitted to the World Trade Organization. All right? This is after China, the Chinese-American Free Trade Agreement. This is what Mr. Inmelt said, and I quote, When I am talking to GE managers, I talk China, 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 China. That's him, not me, five Chinas. You need to be there. You need to change the way people talk about it and how they get there. I am a nut on China. Outsourcing from China is going to grow to five billion. We are building a tech center in China. Every discussion today has the center on China. The cost basis is extremely attractive. You can take an 18 cubic foot, re foot refrigerator, make it in China, land it in the United States, and land it for less than we can make an 18 cubic foot refrigerator today ourselves. This is the head of General Electric, who, by the way, I guess is President Obama's great advisor in creating jobs in America, two years after the China agreement was signed. And on and on it goes. It's not just Mr. Inmelt. It is major corporation after major corporation. Before the agreement, its jobs were great in America. After the agreement, it's all of the advantages of outsourcing. And let me tell you how bad the situation is. And I think most Americans know that not only it is a disaster for our economy that we're not producing the products we consume, but it is, it is really an embarrassment. And I'll give you an example. Mr. President, uh, last year, the holiday season, I walked into the uh, Smithsonian Museum's very beautiful American History Museum. It's a great museum, and I urge everybody who come to Washington to visit. I walked into the gift shop of the Smithsonian Museum, owned by the people of America, paid for by the people of America. You know what their gift shop had? Most of the products in the gift shop were not made in America. Turns out they were made in China, made in other countries, low-wage countries around the world. I went to a section where they had little busts of, president of the presidents of the United States, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Barack Obama. You turn it up. You know where these busts of presidents of the United States were made? Yeah, you guessed it, in China. Well, we have since been having some discussions uh, with the Smithsonian. They're in the process of changing their policies. We're working with other people as well. But that's how bad the situation is that busts of American presidents made in a museum owned by the people of the United States of America talking about the history and culture of America are made in China. That's just one example of how pathetic this whole situation is. Um, and on and on it goes. And by the way, Mr. President, when we talk about trade, we often focus on blue-collar jobs, on manufacturing jobs, but it is also increasingly uh, information technology jobs and white-collar jobs. You know, and, and just think for a moment, Mr. President, that during the past four years, the cumulative trade deficit with China in advanced technology, I'm not talking about sneakers, Advanced technology products total more than $300 billion. Last year, our trade deficit with China on advanced technology products was a staggering $92 billion in one year alone. I just bought one of these very nice uh, iPhones. It is very, very nice. You know where that product is made? It's made in China. And the I iPad is made in China. And the iPod and the Blackberry and IBM computers and Dell computers and Microsoft Xbox and big screen TVs. None of these American inventions, we pride ourselves. Steve Jobs recently passed away, great business person. But we pride ourselves on developing 
these technologies, but where are they made? More often than not, they are made in China. According to a December 15, 2010 article in the Wall Street Journal, quote, one widely touted solution for current U.S. economic woes is for America to come up with more of the high-tech gadgets that the rest of the world craves. Yet two academic researchers estimate that Apple's iPhone, one of the best-selling U.S. technology products, actually added $1.9 billion to the U.S. trade deficit with China last year. So we developed these products, but we can't manufacture them here because these companies prefer low, wage, low wages in China. And on and on it goes. Not just blue-collar, white-collar jobs as well. Mr. President, um, and, and today, we're not talking about China, we're not talking about Mexico, we're talking about Korea, we're talking about Panama, we're talking about Colombia. But it's the same old story. Chamber of Commerce is back again, creating all of these jobs till the day after the agreement is signed, and then going to be talking about how uh, they can throw American workers out on the street. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, Mr. President. Uh, poll after poll shows that, to say the least, the American people do not have uh, an enormous amount of respect for the United States Congress and, and see Congress living in a very different world than working class people are living in. And I don't know of any example where that schizophrenia is greater, greater than in terms of trade. You go back home, I don't know what it's like in Rhode Island, tell you what it's like in Vermont, you ask people, well, what do you think about these trade agreements with China? Do you think they're creating jobs in America? And people say, are you nuts? Of course they're not. Everybody knows that. And the polls tell us that. In September 2010, an NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, 69% of Americans believe that, quote, free trade between the United States and other countries costs the U.S. jobs, end of quote. I think every group in America, except the United States Congress, seems to get that point. But then again, the United States Congress is surrounded by lobbyists and campaign contributors that come from big money interests, and they like these unfettered free trade agreements. In terms of Korea, let me say a word about the Korean agreement. The Economic Policy Institute has estimated that the Korean free trade agreement will lead to the loss of 159,000 American jobs and will increase the trade deficit by nearly 14 billion over a seven year period. Why do you want to go forward in a trade agreement that will cost you jobs? Now, President Obama has estimated that the Korea free trade agreement will, quote, support at least 70,000 American jobs, end the quote, but the headline of a December 7, 2010 article in the New York Times says it all, quote, few new jobs expected soon from free trade agreement with South Korea. According to this article, the Korean free trade agreement is likely to result in little, if any, net job creation in the short run, according to the government's own analysis, our government's own analysis. This analysis was done by the U.S. International Trade Commission, which projects that our overall trade deficit will increase, not decrease, if Korea free trade is implemented. This is our own International Trade Commission. What are we doing? What are we doing? Now, Mr. President, let me just touch on one aspect of the Korea Free Trade Agreement, which deserves a lot of focus, and I fear very much that it's not. And that is that the Korean Free Trade Agreement will force American workers, not just to compete against lower wage workers in, in, in South Korea, but also to compete against the virtual slave labor conditions that exist in North Korea, a country which is certainly one of the most undemocratic uh, countries in, in the world. And to add insult to injury, not only are our workers going to be competing against slave labor in North Korea, some of the proceeds from this free trade will go to the dictatorship of Kim Jong-il, certainly one of the more vicious uh, dictators in the entire world. And what that is about, Mr. President, is that uh, a number of uh, companies uh, in South Korea, including uh, Hyundai uh, and many others, uh, own companies that are doing business in a large industrial area in North Korea. And uh, what this agreement will allow 
is products made in North Korea to go to South Korea and then come back into the United States of America. And I know there's been a little bit of confusion on this, but there shouldn't be. According to a January 2011 report from the Congressional Research Service, quote, I hope everybody who plans on voting for this free trade agreement with, with Korea hears this. Quote, this is CRS. There is nothing to prevent South Korean firms from performing intermediate manufacturing operations in North Korea and then performing final manufacturing processes in South Korea. For example, as much as 65% of the value of a South Korean car coming into the United States could actually be made in North Korea if this trade agreement goes into effect. And today we have over 47,000 North Korean workers are currently employed by more than 120 South Korean firms, including Hyundai at the Kaesing Industrial Complex in North Korea. What an agreement. What an agreement. Slave labor in North Korea, manufacturing products which go to South Korea and then come into the United States of America. And meanwhile, the dictatorship of North Korea gets a piece of the action, a significant piece of the action on top of the pennies an hour that the North Korean workers uh, get. Uh, in 2007, uh, Han duk su who was then the Prime Minister of South Korea and is now the current South Korean Ambassador to the United States said, and I quote, Ambassador to the United States said, the planned ratification of the South Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement will pave the way for the export of products built in Kaesong, North Korea, to the U.S. market, end of quote. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Bad enough for workers in our country to have to compete against people in China and in Vietnam, people are making 20, 30 cents an hour, 40 cents an hour. Now we're asked to compete against slave labor in North Korea. And that's the treaty that people will be voting for today. Uh, Mr. President, I think a lot of folks have mentioned, uh, in terms of Colombia, the assault on trade unionists there. Since 1986, some 2,800 trade unionists have been assassinated. Less than 6% of these murders have been prosecuted by the Colombian government. Uh, and last year alone, last year alone in a small country, more than 50 trade unionists were assassinated in Colombia, up 9% from 2009. Now, I would ask you, Mr. President, if in Colombia 50 CEOs of companies were killed last year, were murdered last year, do you think that people here would be voting for a free trade agreement with Colombia? Or would they say, why would we want an agreement with a company, with a country which is so unlawful, which is so brutal, where so many CEOs are being killed? But it's not CEOs, it's just trade union leaders. So I guess it is okay to have an agreement there. I would also tell you, Mr. President, that uh, President Obama had a different view on Colombia when he was a candidate for president in 2008. In October of 2008, candidate Barack Obama said that, quote, the history in Colombia right now is that labor leaders have been targeted for assassination on a fairly consistent basis and there have not been prosecutions, end of quote. Candidate Obama in 2008 was right to oppose this trade agreement. Unfortunately, as president, he is wrong to support it right now. Let me say a word about the Panama Free Trade Agreement. Now, Panama is a very small country. Its entire uh, annual economic output is only $26.7 billion a year, or about two-tenths of 1% of the American economy. So I think no one is going to legitimately stand up here and say that trading with such a small country uh, is going to significantly increase American jobs. Then why would we? Why would we be considering a trade agreement with Panama? What's going on there? Well, it turns out, Mr. President, that Panama is a world leader when it comes to allowing wealthy Americans and large corporations to evade U.S. taxes by stashing their cash in offshore tax havens. And the Panama Free Trade Agreement would make this bad situation much worse. Uh, as I'm a member of the Budget Committee, as you are, Mr. President, and we have heard testimony time and time again that our country is losing up to $100 billion every year 
as corporations stash their money in postal addresses in the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, and in Panama. And this trade agreement makes that situation even worse. According to Citizens for Tax Justice, quote, a tax haven has one of three characteristics. It has no income tax or a very low rate income tax. It has bank secrecy laws, and it has a history of non-cooperation with other countries on exchanging information about tax matters. Panama has all three of those, and they are probably the worst end of quote, according to Citizens for Tax Justice. The trade agreement with Panama would effectively bar the United States from cracking down on illegal and abusive offshore tax havens in Panama. In fact, combating tax haven abuse in Panama would be a violation of this free trade agreement exposing the U.S. to fines from international authorities. Well, at a time when we have a $14 trillion plus national debt, and at a time when we are frantically figuring out ways to try to lower our deficit, some of us believe that it is a good idea to do away with all of these tax havens by which the wealthy and large corporations stash their money abroad and avoid paying U.S. taxes. The Panama Trade Agreement would make that goal uh, even more difficult. I want to say another word. Uh, on uh, issues that is, I think, important uh, as we look into the future. The proposed Korea Free Trade Agreement threatens both the 340B drug program, which requires drug companies to provide discounts on covered outpatient drugs purchased by federally funded health providers, such as community health centers and other safety net providers, and the ability of Medicare Part B to hold down the prices of outpatient drugs. The Korean Free Trade Agreement would potentially allow Korean drug manufacturers to challenge the pricing under these programs on the grounds that the prices are not market driven. In other words, forcing prices up in this country. And that is something that was pushed, by the way, by our trade, uh, trade representative, not theirs. In essence, the pharmaceutical industry's lobbyists, with complete indifference to the plight of millions of the most frail and vulnerable Americans, have succeeded in inserting provisions into the Korean trade agreement that would allow Korean companies to maximize their, pro maximize their profits by challenging the cost control measures under the 340B and Medicare Part B programs. But unfortunately, Mr. President, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Right now, the pharmaceutical lobby, and they are a very, very powerful lobby, and the United States Trade Representative are negotiating a new trade agreement, the so-called Trans-Pacific Partnership, that I fear very much will make a bad situation in terms of drug access for the developing world, for poor people all over the world, much worse than it already is. Their aim, yet again, is to maximize stroke company profits at the expense of the most vulnerable populations by tying the hands of health authorities here and in other developed and developing countries abroad who seek to provide access to low-cost generic pharmaceutical drugs for their citizens. In negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership, our government is actively pushing intellectual property laws for medicines that are more restrictive than we impose even here in the United States with the effect of making it far more difficult to get generic drugs on the market in those countries. One of them, Vietnam, is a good example. Vietnam obviously is a very, very poor country. Vietnam has received more than $320 million from the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, created under President George W. Bush and continued under President Obama since 2004. The function of this program is to make sure that the poorest people in the world who have diseases like AIDS are able to get the drugs they need at a price they can afford to pay. And that means generic, making generic treatments available. The PEPFAR program has actually had significant success. And as somebody who was not a great fan of President George W. Bush, this is an area where he actually did something quite positive. 
And that program is credited with saving millions of lives in 15 developing nations over the last seven years. In the face of one of the most severe humanitarian crises in modern history, the United States put billions of dollars into doing something about it, and we are doing that today. So why, in the face of this success, by one arm of our government, would another arm work to pull the rug out from underneath it? Yet that is what the U.S. Trade Representative's Office is doing just now. So in other words, on one hand, what we are trying to do is the right thing, the humanitarian thing, and make sure that poor and sick people around the world are able to get the medicines that they desperately need to stay alive at a price they can afford to pay. And on the other hand, another part of the United States government is saying, wait a second, we ought to protect the interests of the drug companies, make sure that they can make as much money as possible, that they can charge and force poor companies to pay outrageously high prices for drugs, even if that means that many, many people die because they can't afford those drugs. So this is a contradiction. This is what our new trade policies are about. Uh, I will be back on the floor at some point in the not too distant future to be talking about this very, very important issue. But let me just conclude, Mr. President, by saying this. This country is in the midst of the worst economic crisis since the 1930s. Middle class is disappearing. Poverty is increasing. Millions of Americans have seen a decline in their standard of living. The gap between the very rich and everybody else is growing wider. That is the reality of the American economy today. One of the reasons for the collapse of the middle class is the loss of millions and millions of good paying manufacturing jobs. And one of the key reasons, not the only reason, but one of the key reasons that we are losing millions of manufacturing jobs are disastrous trade policies designed designed to allow American corporations to shut down here, move to low-wage countries, hire people there, pennies an hour, bring their products back. That is a policy, I suppose you can say, that has worked if you're the CEO of a large corporation. You make a lot more money paying people 50 cents an hour than $20 an hour. You make a lot more money working in a country where there are no environmental standards rather than in a country where you have to have some standards protecting air and water. That's what our trade policy has been. And it seems to me to be enormously foolish for us to continue this failed policy of NAFTA, of CAFTA, of permanent normal trade relations with China, and extend them to Korea, Panama, and Colombia. I urge, I urge my colleagues to stand up to the big money interests who want us to pass these trade agreements, stand up for American workers, and say no. Trade is a good thing, but it has to be based on principles that protect ordinary Americans, working people, not just the CEOs of large corporations. With that, Mr. President, I would uh, yield the floor.